ready for trouble. Glorious trouble. Overdue trouble. The kind of trouble that takes your breath away. Trouble in Mind is the play of the moment raised the New York Times. It deserves to be a classic. New York Magazine calls it a masterpiece of astonishing power. You absolutely must see it. Don't miss this New York Times critic's pick, Trouble in Mind, a Broadway premiere over 60 years in the making through January 9th only. Visit roundabouttheater.org. Good afternoon and welcome back to My Harlem Portraits, the show that wants to shed the light on the fundamental contribution of African-Americans to the building of this country and to the incredible Black excellence that is out there and sometimes is not known at all. To impersonate this Black excellence today, we have an amazing, multi-talented and eclectic theater, TV and film director and producer, screenwriter and playwright, Mr. Charles Randolph Wright. Welcome to my Harlem Portraits. Thank you, I'm thrilled to be part of your Harlem Portrait, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you because I know you are very, 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 very busy. You are doing right now Trouble in Mind on Broadway, which you directed. So I know that giving me this time has been very difficult for you. So I thank you even more. Among your most known works, for those of our viewers who don't know you, don't know you very well, there is Preaching to the Choir in 2005. Then you have uh, Motown, the Broadway show that you directed in uh, 2016 or something like that. I don't remember exactly the date. Then Green Leaf, which is a TV series. And then most recently, The Big Leap on Fox. And these are just few of the amazing uh, movies, documentaries, TV series, and theater pieces that you have been directing or producing or writing and so on. You are also the acclaimed director who finally brought to life for the, its premiere on Broadway by the Roundabout Theatre Company, Trouble in, Ma Trouble in Mind, which is currently running until January 9th, 2022. This powerful play about the behind the curtains dramas of the making of a Broadway play was written in 1955 by the great, but I believe under-recognized playwright, Alice Childress. It is, I saw it because I met you at the premiere. It is moving, it is ironic, it's satirical and is politically and socially current as if it was written today, which made it pretty controversial at the time. So tell us why, and tell us a little bit about the plot. Well, Alice Childress wrote this in 1955. It was off-Broadway, a success off-Broadway. The producers wanted to move it to Broadway, which would have made Alice the first Black female playwright on Broadway. But they wanted the content to be changed. They wanted a happy ending. They wanted all these things. Basically, they did not want to be portrayed the way that Alice she, she took this light and placed it there and said, look, this is what we're dealing with. This is where we are in 1955. Here in 2021, we're dealing with these same issues. Alice back then said no. And so the play never made it to Broadway. Um, several years later, Raisin in the Sun became the first Black female playwright's work on Broadway. And Alice never had that chance. The play has been performed around the country in various theaters, but never was on that Broadway stage. And her dream was to have any of her work on Broadway and out of all of her incredible plays, none, none of that happened. Wow. And so I first read this many decades ago in college and was stunned by the words and what this lead character goes through because the woman who is the star of the show, Willetta Mayer played just astonishingly by Lachance. I mean, it's it's one it's one of the great performances in history on Broadway. And she is an actress who is middle aged, and finally she's getting to do a role. She thinks where she gets to show her real self as opposed to the maids she's been subjugated to play all these years. And so they get into rehearsal, and even though she's not wearing a maid's uniform, 
she is still playing a maid. She is still treated with that same sensibility. And what happens to her in the play, she finally says no. The way that Alice said no. The way that I think so many people, what's happened during the pandemic is that so many of us finally also say, no, we must be seen, we must be heard. And that's what this play does. And I'm so thrilled at its reception. I have to admit, I was somewhat surprised that because it is as hard hitting now as it was back then, which is really disappointing that we're dealing with these same issues. But I am so thrilled that I was able to finally get this show and to get roundabout to do this. It's, it's taken me 15 years to get this play on Broadway. And to have it at this moment in this time, I feel as if Alice orchestrated it and said, this is now, this is when I'm on Broadway. So I'm, I'm so very proud of the work that everyone has done. The actors in this, or every single one, they're tremendous, but led by LaShawns, it's, it's breathtaking. It's a monumental performance and hopefully a monumental production. I, totally agree with this. I was mesmerized that night. And uh, the fact that I was able afterwards to be at the greet, meet and greet with the cast and ask you guys questions and, and enter more, even more into the play was just fantastic because I didn't know this writer. So for me, it was a discovery. And it's an amazing discovery. And the way you directed it, wow. the, the scenes, the way the scenes were made and where the actor came in and out and so on, the way you directed it was, I mean, like a bombshell, I think. It was really wow. fantastic. So I loved it. Thank you so much. I wanted it to be authentic. I wanted it to be what Alice would have wanted, who lived in Harlem who you know, grew up in South Carolina as I did, but then moved and moved to Harlem. And so she was a child of the Renaissance. And all of that, I feel, is a part of what that is. Um, the desire to change, to, as I said, be seen differently. And the, the play is extraordinarily written. Yes, it's so real. Yes. When the character, they... It's done in a such an ironic uh, way that sometimes you laugh like crazy, sometimes you really want to cry. Some, it, it's really beautiful. And what made you decide to direct the play? Because this is not an easy play to direct. It's not an easy play to put on. Most of these issues are still there, although maybe not as much in Broadway as they were before but they're still there in our society in general. So what made yes. you decide this? The words, and she inspired me with what she placed on paper before I was born. These words that, that literally go through me and her words gave me the tenacity. It gave me the bravery to keep going because she was so brave in saying no. And I thought I must fight this battle. I must do what I can to have this happen. So it was, I, I felt as if I had to do it. It's been one of those projects as people talk about things. It just, it's, it's spoken to me for so long. It has spoken to me for so long and I just wanted it. I wanted Alice to be recognized. And I knew, especially at the Roundabout Theater that's known for doing classic plays, that if this play happened at the Roundabout, Alice would now be in the canon of great American playwrights. And, and I am beyond thrilled that now she is. Now she will be recognized. That people like you, I mean, in Harlem Portraits, Alice should be a part of that, you know, and she is. And she will be now, and that's what, and you must read her other plays and her novels. I mean, her work, it, her work was tremendous and ahead of its time, unfortunately, because in her time, she didn't get her due, but I feel now she, she truly is. She will be discovered thanks to this. Yes. By more and more people and by more and more uh, producers and so on, who will probably be uh, also putting on the other plays that she has, she has done. So that 
thanks to you and this amazing cast that uh, you put together. What are just one or two moments where you felt that it was so difficult, you know, ah, am I gonna make it? And then those moments in which you said, yes, this is gonna happen and it's gonna be wonderful. Well, the most difficult thing about doing this is working during COVID because we had to, you know, the protocols and we were testing every other day and just having to stay in a bubble and not, typically you work on something and then you go out and you talk about it and you see people and you have friends that come and you all share this and we weren't able, we didn't have an opening night party. We only had a few people that were able to come to that. So we, we've had to be very protected to stay to maintain that work. And that, that was difficult because it was unusual, but it was also very, it focused us. We, we, it was just with us. And those nine actors are so connected. They're such, they're, they're this, this, this organism that mm -hmm. just lives and breathes. And, and they all amaze me in their work. So that was the most difficult thing. And also wondering what Alice wanted you, it's it, when you're working with the playwright, you're able to talk about what something is and yeah. what do you feel and is that happening and what does this mean? And so we had to, to do the work. I had to really think about what was happening in 1955. What does that mean? All of those things were a part of that. And, and then you would have these moments in rehearsal, in performance where it just all connected. I mean, that's the greatest thing when you just realize that it comes together and it is organic and it is authentic. And as you said, it moves people and it makes them laugh so that the humor, the humor is there and the pathos is there and it comes together. And I think what art can do is heal. And I feel this piece although it does not have the happy ending those producers wanted, this piece is a way to communicate for people to talk to each other because we don't do that anymore. And theater hopefully can elicit that. It can spark conversations. And that's, that's really important. And those conversations can lead to change, can lead to healing. Absolutely. And the fact that art is really a, a overall language, a language that is understood everywhere. It makes it even more of an important tool to be able to speak and to show what's going on in your society, in our society nowadays. Also for the children and the great children, like we are now looking at her work from six, more than 60 years ago, then your work now will be looked upon and to reflect what the society we have, that we have now and all the craziness that is going on now. We are living in the most incredible, crazy times of my existence, of your existence, imagine. Yes, and, and sanity. And so we must do something about that. And I do feel that trouble in mind has had a place and will have a place in this. And I am, I am so proud and, and so grateful that, that um, I was able to do it, that I am able to do it. And we are grateful you were able to uh, do it. <laughs> thank you. The public is enjoying it. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your immediate future because yes. this, when uh, Trouble in Mind will be ending, in January, is there a possibility that is, uh, there is more performances added to it? Well, schedule-wise, that, that, that is not possible because in the theater is, a, a, you know, they have different shows in for yes. a, a, a definite amount of time. So unfortunately, in this incarnation, um, it, that's not happening. It's gonna but, be you know, I, I, we night. want other lives for this. That's what we are looking for. So for our viewers, you need to see this show. It's the most incredible show. Yes. You have to go before January 9th. Right. All right. And there are also uh, reduced price tickets. If you look on the internet and so on, 
you go to Marcia Pendleton sites and so on, you will get also reduced price tickets. So, but go and see this play because it is amazing. Now, in your immediate future, you and Debbie Allen, the great Debbie Allen, are the executive producers of Bring Them Back, which is a documentary about the uh, charismatic Maurice Hines that is scheduled to be released at the IFC Center in New York City from the 5th of January to the 11th of January and will then be broadcast on stars. So this is a story of the brother of the more famous uh, Gregory Hines. So tell us again, why did you choose this? Why are you doing this? And what, what is the, the connection there? Because I met, I met him a few times and uh, it must be not easy to be the brother of someone as famous. When I first came to New York, Maurice Hines became a mentor for me. And um, as when I was first performing, he saw me performing. And it's funny, he used to call me Baby Diva. That was my, <laughs> that was my <laughs> name back then. But he and I had just, he was always this, this force of nature and so confident in who yes. he was. And, his, his so charismatic and just an extraordinary performer. And I thought, I, I want that. I want to have that kind of freedom as an artist. And then years later, I ended up directing him in Guys and Dolls, which was a national tour. We did production of Sophisticated Ladies. So different things. So I've, I've had several relationships with him, mentor, mentee, switching, becoming his director, and just being a, a very dear friend. And I was the documentary filmmakers, John Coluscio and Tracy Hopkins, um, Maurice had mentioned me to them. And so I met them and I would, they interviewed me for to be in the film. And so I was talking about Maurice and our relationship and various things. And I ended up just becoming involved with them, helping them make this happen, helping the many different aspects of it and ended up along with Debbie becoming an executive producer of it. And just before, I guess it was November before the pandemic, we were in the New York Documentary Film Festival and won the festival. And that's one of the biggest film festivals in the world. Yes. And, and for that to win, but because I think, it, it, again, I love pieces, obviously, that deal with passion. And the passion of Maurice Hines is extraordinary. And also like Alice, I wanted Maurice acknowledged. You know, more people obviously know Gregory, but Maurice is also extraordinary. Absolutely. And you in this film really, it deals with their relationship. It deals with his performing. It deals with his life. It, it's such, I am, I am so happy that people get to see the person that I know who I have um, loved for so long and respected and who helped me become the work that I do. So much of that is because he opened a door for me. He gave me permission to be who I am. And that's so imperative. How, how do you get permission? Where does that come from? And to be able to have been a part of this film that celebrates and acknowledges him is, it's a way in a way I get to give back to him and the film is fantastic and it's just the the filmmakers did an, an amazing job of how they tell this story and what they found and how they let you see who this astonishing man is right. how long did it take to collect all the material and all the um, several years i don't know the exact time frame but it was it was several years and, and you see that in the film it was several years of that happening. And so to now have this product that represents him in an extraordinary way is fantastic. With all the facets that he has. All the facets. I saw and some and they of definitely it. come out. They definitely come out in this. Yes. <laughs> Believe me. So and which is it's 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 a wonderful, wonderful moving, also moving, also funny, all mm. of it. It's it's uh it it's Again, I love things that are authentic. And this, this is a person who lived by what he believed in. He was his own person and refused to change. 
just like Alice. Just like Alice. And it's a piece of history that needs to be told. Absolutely. Yes. yes. And I'm, I am I am so pleased that it's on film, that it's there, that there is this record, especially that younger audiences can see because I want them, it's, it's like with Alice, for example, as well, to know that history because our history is, is so easily erased. Look at what's happening with critical race theory right now in this, yes. in this country. Erase that history so we don't have to deal with it. And in my work, history always plays a huge part in that. This is actually the reason why I'm doing this program is because I live in Harlem and I moved here in 2005. And I've been so welcomed by the Harlem community that now I feel much more home in Harlem than I feel in Italy. Uh, it's incredible. Yes. This yes. is my family. I love that. And I love that you, I thank you for wanting to put this in your way out in the world. That's that it's, it's very important. It's very important and appreciated. Thank you so much. And as you say, yes, because the reason why I want to do that is because I know what Europeans, I lived all over Europe because I was in the European Parliament before. before. So I know what Europeans know about African-Americans and all the writers and the uh, playwrights and the filmmakers and so on. And it's very, very important that this knowledge is increased because the knowledge is very, very little. And I discovered some pearls, some diamonds like her now, you know? And I'm, I'm so happy about that. To know. So that, that's fantastic. All right, so I'm going to ask you something more. We don't have much time. We, we got maybe two minutes left. That is very intriguing for me because he is one of my two heroes. Sidney Poitier's life story is going to inspire a Broadway play, which will be written by you. And it will be directed by Ruben Santiago, Ruben Santiago Hudson. So, and I know that the Poitier family have uh, searched and wanted you and Ruben Santiago to be the ones who made, who will make this movie. So tell me about this, this play. Um, I first met Mr. Poitier many years ago when I directed a play that he saw and we went out to dinner and I literally was unable to speak because like, I mean, I idolized him and I just sat there and I finally thanked him for everything. I just said, thank you for everything. And they quoted this in an article, but I said, and, and he turned to me and said, if I have inspired you in any way, you have more than paid me back with what I saw. And wow. that kept me going through all the times, all the things, all the fights I've had to fight because artists of color don't have equity with, yeah. with other artists. I mean, that's the, you know, and so having, hearing, I could hear his voice in my head and it just kept me going. And so years later, uh, he always wanted to do a one man show on Broadway because obviously he was in Raisin in the Sun. Yeah. Ironically, the way my life, my circles are, he worked with Alice Childress and, and he wow. is the one that told Alice she should start writing. There's a, people have oh said that he, Alice's first play, uh, she wrote because Sydney said you should be writing. And mm -hmm. so the, the, the circles, that circ that, that's amazing doing this. That's and incredible. so several years ago, I spent time with him out in, in Los Angeles and we just talked and I came up with the way that I wanted to tell the story and mm -hmm. how it would be. And he had always seen it as a one person show. And I have a different view that mm -hmm. I told them about and the family loved it. And they, they chose me to do this, which I still can't believe I'm saying that to you. The idea, and it's been several years and um, we were working on it prior to, prior to the pandemics, as I call them. And um, so <laughs> yeah, it's, now, it's now 
time to make that happen. But working with him and working with his daughter, with his wife, with his family has been a, a dream come true. Yes. It is a dream come true to be able to give back to this idol, you know, to work with someone like Maurice, who meant so much to me. And now to be able to put Mr. Poitier's life on stage is, it, it's, it's daunting, you know, it's, it's, it's frightening. And I feel I was meant to do it at the same time. So I'm, I'm, it's, it's, it's an amazing time. And Ruben Santiago Hudson is my dear friend and we've been wanting to do something and we have worked on other things, but the idea of us together on this, that the family, they, and I just remember, I just had this flash now of Ruben and me sitting in the Poitiers house and just talking with wow. him and just what that felt like, what, what that, it, it's amazing to have had the time with him that I have had. I will cherish that for the rest of my life. Fantastic. I think yeah. this wouldn't be a better moment to conclude our wonderful <laughs> conversation because uh, Sydney Poitier and Sydney Poitier, yes. together with yes. Harry Melafonte in yes. Europe, they were the men who were well known and their movie. Guess who's coming for dinner tonight? It was a groundbreaking movie. Everything he did was groundbreaking as, <laughs> as an actor, as a director, because he did many films as a director. And the thing that astonishes me every time I would speak to him is how much grace he had. He's so, he's so grateful because his life is extraordinary and where he came from, it's so unlikely that he became who Sidney Poitier. Mm -hmm. and, but he's so grateful and it just, it, it just keeps as, as angry as I get about what the, what we must face and what we must do. Yeah. You have a conversation with him and you realize, you know, I must also okay. have that kind of, I, I strive for that kind of grace and may, may we all, right? May yes. we all. And this is the time to have that because this, as you said, the pandemics, the, the races, race pandemic and the COVID pandemic have yes. really come together in a way that we need to fight like crazy to keep. We do. And so you keep fighting with what you do. And I, you know, as I said, I really appreciate that. And I'm, I'm very pleased that we made this happen today. So yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm so grateful to you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you for being with us. And thank you for being with my Harlem Portraits. We see you next Saturday, 12.30. Bye-bye. 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 We were dancers uh, from uh, early, and then we traveled all around the world. And we decided in 1959 we were in London. And uh, dancing, of course, had gone out uh, just as we had gotten into it. As African Americans in the 60s started to become more aware of their own beauty and their own sense of self, there were certain aspects of show business that African Americans felt like they had to let go and move forward. And I could certainly understand that. And tap dancing was one of those things. And so my brother and myself uh, asked my mother, and she said, well, if that's what you want to do, do it. <laughs>